Welcome back to The Glow Life. I'm your host, Maria Marlowe, and today we're breaking down beauty myths and dismantling beauty standards with beauty reporter Jessica DeFino. I've wanted to have Jessica on the podcast for a while now after hearing her on someone else's podcast and really ripping the beauty industry a new one. What I love about Jessica is that she goes beyond the surface level, and when she's reporting on a subject, she goes deep. And she's talking about things I haven't seen any other beauty reporters talk about. Things like youth obsession, this perfection obsession. She talks about ingredients that are glorified that may actually be doing more harm than good to our skin, and so much more. She really spends most of her time dismantling beauty standards, debunking marketing myths, and exploring how beauty culture impacts people physically, psychologically, and psycho-spiritually. She is basically calling BS on the beauty industry. So I think you'll really enjoy this episode. You'll learn a lot. There will probably be quite a few surprises, maybe a few disappointments learning about some, some of the products you may use, but it's all for the best. This episode is brought to you by The Clear Skin Plan, my 90-day program and meal plan to clear your skin from within naturally through dietary and lifestyle changes. Skin issues like acne are not only skin deep. They start deep within with internal inflammation and imbalances. The only way to clear your skin is to address those underlying root causes, and The Clear Skin Plan will help you do just that. With the plan, you'll discover the potential underlying root causes of your breakouts and how to remedy them through dietary and lifestyle changes. You'll also get over a hundred delicious skin clearing recipes, which you can mix and match or follow the weekly sample meal plans with shopping lists. This program is science backed, dermatologist approved and doctor recommended. To get it, head to mariamarlo.com forward slash clear dash skin dash plan. Jessica, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks so much for having me. So you're described as a beauty writer who essentially gives the middle finger to the beauty industry. So <laughs> how did you get here? <laughs> oh, it was a long and winding journey that started with the Kardashians. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess one of, one of my first experiences of working within the beauty industry was being an assistant editor on the Kardashian Jenner official apps in 2015. I was part of the launch team that, that started all of that. Um, and yeah, clearly the Kardashians are big into beauty. So there was a lot of beauty content on the sites that I was um, creating with the sisters and writing. And um, yeah, the, the more that I got involved with the behind the scenes of beauty media, you know, PR, people were sending me products to try. Um, I started experiencing my own skin issues because I was trying so many products for the app and because I was in a high stress environment. Um, and then I started researching like, wait, what is my skin going through? And all of this sort of culminated in realizing that the beauty industry uh, is really serving as a bunch of bullshit. <laughs> and I wanted to change that. So I sort of pivoted career paths and ended up working in beauty. Yeah. And your writing is so refreshing because I think a lot of beauty writers, they'll take the press release and just spit it out verbatim. Uh -huh. Whereas you do a little bit more digging and you're saying, oh, is this true? Or, you know, is this really the case? Right. I mean, that has not always been the case for me. And I will say that working within the beauty media has helped me understand why there's so much misinformation and why so many articles are basically just copy paste press releases. Um, just the way, the way the media is set up is not conducive to thoroughly research, investigated and fact checked information. For example, when I was a staff reporter, I was responsible for writing two to three stories um, a day. My shift would be six hours long. And within that time, I would have to come up with ideas, pitch them to my editor, research the story, do interviews, write the story, fact check everything, source images, create product shopping carousels and publish it. So, I mean, it's, it, it's impossible to do good work with those parameters. Um, so yeah, it's sort of been my mission to carve out a space for myself in the industry where I don't have to work within those parameters and I can really dedicate myself to the information. 
So what have been some of the most surprising things you realize? Like, what are some of the popular products where you're just like, oh, please don't put that on your skin? <laughs> I mean, in the most basic sense, like cleansers and exfoliators, <laughs> a lot of cleansers are made with ingredients that strip the skin of its natural oils. And although the industry has sort of vilified those natural oils, those oils are very important to skin functioning and moisturization and keeping everything going. Um, so really over cleansing your skin is kind of the first step of sort of becoming almost addicted to products. Um, exfoliators as well, we've been taught that exfoliating is so great and that it you know, takes off the dead skin cells and reveals the fresh young skin cells underneath. But um, dead skin cells exist for a reason and they serve a really important purpose. They're part of the skin's protective mechanisms. And they also are a special shape when they you know, die, they become scientifically, they're called corneocytes. And corneocytes are the only skin cells that can hold the skin's natural moisturizing factors, which are humectants that draw water from the environment into the skin. Um, and so young cells underneath them don't have that capacity. So when we're exfoliating, we're actually impairing our skin's ability to moisturize itself. And again, starting ourselves on this, this cycle of needing products to do what the skin already knows how to do inherently. It's interesting, right? Our skin is functioning well, then we start using the products and then we start needing more of the products to fix the issues that the products exactly. created. Exactly. I mean, that's why the industry is so huge. <laughs> And what about hyaluronic acid? This was one, uh, I heard you talk about it on another <laughs> po podcast and I feel like that's a, a favorite uh, amongst a lot of people. Yeah, everyone loves hyaluronic acid because they say it holds a thousand times its weight in water. So you think about that and you think, oh great, that'll be super moisturizing for my skin. And there are so many things wrong with this. First of all, the hyaluronic acid that exists within our own bodies, you know, it naturally occurs in the body. That stuff is incredible. It is a miracle ingredient. It can hold so much moisture. The body stores this in um, the deeper layers of the skin. And it stores it within the deeper layers of the skin for a reason. Um, because it draws moisture, it's drawing moisture from within, from your internal hydration, from drinking water, from eating water-rich foods, all of that. It draws that moisture that you ingest into the lower layers of your skin and uses it for protection, for plumpness, for elasticity, all of those great things. When you put hyaluronic acid on the surface, it draws water from the closest source. Um, and that is your natural moisture stores, your natural hyaluronic acid molecules. So what's happening is you put it on the surface, this synthetic hyaluronic acid draws up the moisture that your skin is already holding where it wants it, brings it to the surface. What happens when moisture is on the surface? It can evaporate. So effectively what you're doing is you are stealing moisture from within your skin where it can actually do good work bringing it up to the surface and letting the environment just evaporate it into thin air. Over time, that dehydrates your skin. But of course, in the moment you think, oh my God, I look so dewy because suddenly you have all of this hydration on the upper layers of your skin, but it just doesn't belong there. I think that's an interesting point. A lot of these products give us that immediate gratification, but when we look long-term, they're, they're not, <laughs> they're causing a lot of, uh, a lot of problems. That is, I mean, I would say one of the largest challenges in this space is really educating people and letting them know that what might look, you know, quote unquote, good, what society has decided is a good look right then, right in the moment may not actually be beneficial to the health of your skin um, in the long term. And yeah, I think that's a really hard concept for people to, to really internalize. <laughs> yeah. Well, on that subject, let's talk a little bit about retinoids because I've read some of your work on retinoids yeah. uh, and I, I have a similar sentiment. So can you, you share a little bit about your experience with retinoids and um, your thoughts on them? Yeah, I was, I was put on a retinoid when I was a little bit younger. Um, just, just to let everyone who's listening know, I'm not coming at this as somebody who's always had great skin. I have always had skin issues. I started going to the dermatologist when I was like 14. And since then I have been on every possible prescription, topical and internal that you could imagine. I was on antibiotics. I was on retinoids. 
Um, I was put on birth control at a really young age to help with acne. I was on Accutane and I've been on a lot of topical steroids. So I really, my skin has been through the ringer and <laughs> I have the personal experience as well as the scientific research. Retinoids, what they do is essentially they are, um, they are for aesthetics and we have been told that they are for health. So retinoids may help you reach a certain sort of skin aesthetic over time. But what happens is they actually impair the health of the skin long-term as they do it. Um, retinoids disrupt the skin barrier and the skin barrier is basically your skin's built-in protective layer. If you keep your skin barrier and your skin microbiome intact, you really don't have to worry about skincare products. The skin will take care of a lot of it for you. So retinoids essentially disrupt that layer um, they cause what people know as like the retinoid uglies, which is, you know, usually that first two weeks to a month of intense irritation. Um, and that is a sign that you're injuring your skin. <laughs> there is nothing to it besides that the skin is injured and it's trying to heal itself. Um, retinoids over time make your skin more susceptible to environmental damage, to sunlight, to all sorts of exposures that can affect its ability to moisturize, exfoliate, cleanse, protect, and heal itself. So long-term, just not, just not anything that contributes to health. Uh, yeah, I, I think that one's a hard one to swallow, uh, even though it makes sense when you see your skin peeling off and red and flaky and irritated, it makes sense that it's probably not good. If anything else, if you were doing anything <laughs> else to your skin and this was the effect, you would be like, oh, this is not good, let me stop. But we're just kind of trained to think, this is what you have to go through and it'll make your skin better. But over the long term, it just actually ends up making your skin more sensitive. Yeah. And I think, I mean, what we can take away from that experience of the initial peeling and how the skin eventually, you know, evens out over time is just like, wow, how incredible, how like that adaptive ability of our skin to really adapt to the environment that it's in, the products that we put on it that's evidence that it is like this intelligent, almost sentient thing. Um, and it really does respond rather quickly and adapt rather quickly to the things that we put it through. That said, we should not be putting it through so much harm that it has to adapt to. We should just be letting it live its best life. <laughs> Well, I think that brings up a great point. And you and I see very much eye to eye on this. Skincare is more internal, what we eat, what we think, even, you know, our stress levels than it is topical. Mm -hmm. However, beauty industry is like purely topical. Um, <laughs> so what is skincare to you then? If it's not the topical stuff, what is skincare to you? Skincare to me is just, is self-care. Um, the skin is of course connected to everything in our body, it is inherently connected to our brains. Um, and it responds to what we put in it, what we put on it, what we are consuming, what we're thinking, what we're feeling. Like the skin is basically like this, this communication device is how I see it. So whatever's going on in my body or in my brain, because I am very sensitive and I, my skin is very communicative with me, I see those reactions in real time on my face. And I know a lot of people uh, see the same um, because really it, it comes down to science. Um, what was revolutionary for me when I started researching this was discovering the gut brain skin axis, which is uh, basically the gut, the brain and the skin all form from the same bit of embryonic tissue in utero. And from there, they form these like lifelong connections and pathways um, and they are, they're connected for life. So what you eat will often show up on your skin. Um, even emotions, like when you're embarrassed and you blush, that's an example of the skin brain connection. When you're scared and the color drains from your face, skin brain connection. Um, when you're stressed and you get like anxiety, acne, skin brain connection. So all of it is really connected. And often by taking care of your body and by taking care of your mental and emotional well-being, you are taking care of your skin. And crucially, leaving your skin barrier alone and not bothering it with products. And all of that contributes to your overall skin health. 
what's interesting about the skin barrier is now that we're a little bit more aware of it, I think more recently than ever before. Now there's products that are good for your skin barrier. So yeah. <laughs> what are what are your thoughts on those? Is is there anything that you use? Are you using anything topically? I know, um, I believe a while ago you were talking about um, I forget the author of the book, but there's some book about like not washing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah. what are what are you doing topically? <laughs> that, book called, that book is called Clean: The New Science of Skin, and it's by Dr. James Hamblin, who's a public health expert who focuses on the microbiome um, and through his research was led to all of this information on the skin. So if anyone's interested in in how to leave your skin alone um, and let it thrive, I would really recommend that book. Um, As far as all the skin barrier friendly products out there now, it's, there are a lot of ways to look at it. For one, some of these products can be super healing um, and helpful. But you also have to remember a lot of them are being sold by brands that are telling you to first exfoliate away your skin barrier and then two heal your skin with our barrier repair cream. So it's it's important to be mindful of when it is a marketing tactic. Um, overall, I think if you want to support your skin barrier topically, the best thing that you can do is research what your skin barrier actually does and what components are actually part of your skin barrier and belong on the skin surface. Um, And then you can mimic that with topical products and help your skin heal in a way that it can recognize. Um, For instance, uh, ceramides. Ceramides are something that your skin produces naturally. They're in a lot of um, skincare barrier repair creams now. Those are a great thing to have on the surface of your skin. Um, Omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids. Those are on the surface of your skin. They're part of your skin barrier. They're available in a lot of plant-based facial oils. Those are great to have on the surface of your skin if and when it needs help healing and protecting. Um, Something again like hyaluronic acid does not belong on the surface of your skin. So if if that's in like a barrier repair cream, beware. Um, For me, I keep my routine really simple. I cleanse with Monica Honey. Um, which sounds sticky, but really isn't. (laughs) Monica has like incredible healing properties. It basically strengthens the skin's inherent healing mechanisms. Um, It's so powerful that it's kept in Western hospitals in burn units to help repair burned and damaged skin. So it it is really and truly incredible. It's also a humectant, so it helps draw moisture into your skin. Um, It's a prebiotic, so it feeds your microbiome, the beneficial bacteria of your skin. So many great things about Monica Honey. So I cleanse with that. And then I mostly use jojoba oil as a moisturizer. I'll apply it to damp skin. And I love jojoba because it's biomimetic. So it mimics the skin's natural sebum. It's about, it's a 97% chemical match to sebum. So the skin really recognizes it and responds well to it. Um, and it really helps the skin like regulate and get back on track and become more self-sufficient. I love jojoba oil. I also use it um, as a makeup remover. Yes, yes, it's it's incredible. It's, it's really good. And then with the with the honey, funnily enough, I was having dinner with a friend and her mom last night who was telling me five years ago, she got um, like a cut and an infection with MRSA and she didn't want to go on the antibiotics, um, even even though they were telling her to. And so she um, she basically healed it with honey and uh, I think a couple essential oils. So it's it's quite powerful. It's super powerful. And like, yeah, there are levels to it. Um, all like authentic Monica honey will have a UMF factor, unique Manuka factor. Um, so for skin healing, you need at least a 15 plus rating, but I mean, they go up really high. You can get like a 25 or a 30 and that's like very medicinal. I wouldn't recommend that for like everyday use because it is super powerful. Wow. <clears throat> so beyond the topical, you also talk more about the standards and these insane beauty standards that the beauty industry and the media has really created. Uh, Mm -hmm. For example, this emphasis on youth and um, perfection and having the glassy skin. So can you speak to that and like, how do we break free from this hard wiring almost that we have, you know, where this stuff is ingrained in our heads since we're little kids. How do we break free from this? It is so deeply ingrained. And I think part of that conditioning that we get is that we're told when we adhere to these standards, the younger we look, the glassier we look, the more perfect that we look, we'll be happier. 
will be more confident. I mean, you can even look at the names of beauty products and they reinforce this, like it cosmetic sells confidence in a cream and philosophy has hope in a jar. And there's a brand called Dermalect that sells something called self-esteem serum. So like we hear these messages and I think why they are so powerful is because we see them as this path to happiness. And I think the most effective way to sort of break that conditioning and get out of that cycle um, is to understand that it's not necessarily confidence that we get from this hyper focus on beauty. Studies show that this intense focus on our physical and aesthetics um, increases anxiety, it increases depression, it leads to eating disorders, it leads to body dysmorphia, um, it is implicated in self-harm and even in suicide. So we're taught that these things are gonna make us confident and these things are gonna make us happy, but actually materially, more often they are contributing to these negative mental states. They're not making us any happier, you know? Um, and I think when we can understand that and see it in our own lives and see it reflected in you know, scientific literature, that is a really powerful starting point to really start breaking down some of these beauty standards and deciding that you don't want to participate anymore. Yeah, I, I, it's it's hard though, you know, I think mm -hmm. especially because it, now it's not just the TV that we're seeing these standards on, it's also our social media feed. It's also mm -hmm. the girl next door. And um, it becomes like you just, I mean, when sometimes when I look at Instagram, it's like there's a sea of sameness in terms of like just right. faces looking exactly the same. So, um, and even Botox, I know this is actually an interesting right. topic. Um, I had a whole episode on this with this lawyer who um, represented, uh, I think over 50 cases of people who were injured by Botox. Uh, can you speak to a little bit like your thoughts on, on Botox? Yeah, I mean, I think in any conversation about this, it's important to point out that part of the reason why these things have such a grip on us is because we are rewarded by society when we participate. So, you know, quote unquote, pretty people who are participating and getting Botox and getting lip fillers and getting the surgery and doing all of this, um, we see that they uh, get better jobs. They uh, have, are paid more, have better salaries, better social standing, um, even better legal outcomes in the legal system. So there are material benefits to these things. And that also makes it really hard to divest. So I, I just want to put that out there. And also most beauty standards, I mean, all beauty standards are derived from what I see as four main forces, patriarchy, white supremacy, colonialism, and capitalism. So you walk back any standard of beauty and it can be traced back to one of those, those four forces. Okay. So for me, I, once I sort of dove into the history and started to understand that, I started to feel not so good about participating and perpetuating these standards. Um, so my thoughts on something like Botox, for example, yes, it might ease the aging anxiety for the person who is getting it. For the individual, it might help them feel better. But for the collective, it actually compounds the problem. It makes that beauty standard all the more um, powerful and impenetrable and feels like it makes everyone around us feel like it's necessary to keep up. And for me, that's, that's something that's super important. Sometimes I like to compare it to climate change. You know, when we're talking about global warming and we're talking about climate activism, a lot of the times we'll talk about future generations and how we want to leave something better behind for them and how we want to preserve this planet so that future generations of humans have something to enjoy, something to live on. Um, and that's how I feel about beauty standards. I'm really passionate about making sure that future generations don't feel the way that this generation feels. Future generations don't have the extreme anxiety that makes them want to physically mutilate their faces in order to emulate some arbitrary beauty standard that's actually a marker of capitalism and colonialism. Like I don't want anyone else to feel the way that I know I feel and so many of my peers feel. And to me, the only way to do that outside of, you know, pushing for 
policy change um, and advocating for, you know, social and environmental and all of those like social and environmental justice. Aside from that, the only way I know how to do that is to stop participating myself and to shine a light on these issues and ask others to stop participating as well. Yeah, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot to unpack. And I think it's, for many people, easier said than done. Uh, and I think intellectually, it's, it sounds good, but then it's like, okay, when you see whoever uh, maybe getting the better paying job or getting more followers or getting whatever it is, then it's like, uh, you, you kind of want to keep up with the Kardashians or, or whoever's doing it. No, I, I totally get that. And I, I do think just awareness of it is a huge instigator of change. You don't have to divest all at once, all the time. Like I haven't divested completely from beauty standards. There are some things that I do because a lot of our beauty behaviors sort of evolve as emotional coping mechanisms. And to take away somebody's emotional coping mechanisms all at once is not healthy or productive. Um, and I think it's important to be gentle with ourselves and say, no, I actually really can't stop doing that right now because, you know, I haven't worked through my issues with, with aging and with death and that which ha how society treats aging women. So I really need to get, you know, Botox between my eyes while I try and work on the deeper emotional issue behind it. Maybe later I can divest, but like, it's not healthy to just pull these security blankets out from under ourselves, you know? Um, and then the other thing that I always like to mention is that because beauty standards are derived from patriarchy, white supremacy, colonialism, um, it there are bigger material consequences for people from marginalized communities to divest. So people of color, um, gender nonconforming people, trans people, like divesting from traditional beauty standards does have more material consequences for these folks. So it's important to, to keep that in mind, be gentle on yourself, be gentle on others. And um, I do really think that as a straight white cis woman, I feel more, respons more responsibility to try and help break down these oppressive beauty standards. And since you've started doing this work and, and raising awareness around it, have you seen any changes in the beauty industry or uh, the sentiment of people in general? Yeah, I mean, I do think that I have seen a lot of sort of surface level changes in the industry. Like, for example, we see a lot more representation in marketing campaigns these days. Um, things like that, which are not necessarily the material changes that we need. Um, but again, you know, as, as Audre Lorde would say, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. Like we can't expect the beauty industry to really help us divest from the beauty industry. <laughs> like it has to be an outside of the industry sort of thing. Um, for me, it's been really encouraging. I have, I have a newsletter where I post a lot of my work and my articles and I will get emails and comments all the time from people who are doing this work along with me and have decided to stop using skincare. And they'll either be like, oh my God, my skin's amazing now. Or what I hear a lot is my skin is exactly the same. I didn't need 10 products. It looks the, the freaking same, <laughs> which is really encouraging to hear. Um, and yeah, there are a lot of people who are starting to recognize the sort of ugly roots of beauty standards and not participating and just sharing that journey with me. Um, and yeah, it's scary, but there are a lot of us doing it. I think there's a great community out there that is part of this work and we're, we're always recruiting, <laughs> <laughs> looking for more people to join and spread the word. Yeah, and I really love your newsletter, the unpublishable. It's called because what? Because a lot of how, how did the name start? Actually, because a lot of um, the outlets that you write for, they wouldn't publish some of your material, right? Exactly. So, I mean, I would say my work in the beauty industry wasn't always as maybe controversial or radical as it is now. Um, and when I started wanting to write about more pressing issues. I found that I had a lot of trouble getting them published by the people who were, you know, happy to publish my my piece on jojoba oil or happy to publish my piece on like the top 10 nail trends. <laughs> 
Um, so I had these four stories that I thought were really important to tell in early 2020 and I couldn't get them placed anywhere. And after a couple of months of trying, I said, you know what, I'm just gonna write these myself and self publish them and call the newsletter the unpublishable because it's what the beauty industry won't tell you. And I love it. It's a really great newsletter. It's <laughs> one I look forward to each week because you share the stories that I think sometimes people are thinking but won't say or, or things that you really won't find anywhere else. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. So are there any beauty or skincare trends that you're seeing now that are particularly alarming or concerning to you? Yeah, <laughs> the number one thing that comes to mind is this trend of slugging, um, which is basically smearing Vaseline on top of your face as like the last step in your skincare routine. And it's supposed to, you know, make you look really shiny and glowy and seal in all of your skincare products and blah, blah, blah. Um, that really concerns me because, I mean, petroleum jelly is obviously petroleum. It's a fossil fuel derivative it's purified, so it's not necessarily that it's unsafe for your skin, um, but I think it's really dangerous as an industry, as influencers, as journalists, to be promoting fossil fuels as the number one beauty product right now. Um, fossil fuels are destroying the environment. They are contributing to climate change more than anything else, and like <laughs> besides the ethical environmental dilemmas there, if you want to look at it from a purely superficial perspective, like environmental damage and the depletion of the ozone layer and all of that is the number one problem that that um, our skin is facing today. Like all of that impairs the skin's functions and and sort of you know encourages you to use more products because your skin isn't functioning properly because it's exposed to pollution because it's exposed to sunlight and like. I don't know, just just using fossil fuels in your beauty routine is so backwards to me. And I think the industry has a real, um, it has a real need to stand up against that and advocate for not only a safer industry, but a safer environment and just divest from, from fossil fuels completely. So just the petroleum love that I'm seeing lately is, is so concerning. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it's so interesting how things take trend. Uh, you know, they, they become so popular almost seemingly overnight things that are like kind of obscure. Um, like I remember Vaseline, like as a kid, you know, using it once in a while for certain things. Um, but it's interesting how it just pops up. Somebody does it on TikTok or Instagram and then it just explodes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely a, a worrying trend for me. <laughs> Um, and, and let's talk a little bit about plastics and the environmental impact, because I know that's something that you also speak to. So mm -hmm. how do we, um, you know, how do we navigate that? Like, uh, is, is it just that we stop buying products? Uh, yeah, I guess uh, when it comes to the environmental aspect and beauty and skincare. Yeah, I mean, beauty has an incredible impact on the environment. Um, when you think about it, most of the products that we're using incorporate plastic in some way, if not in all ways. Um, most of them have between, you know, 20 and 50 ingredients. And when you think, like when you extrapolate and you think about all of the effort it takes to farm those ingredients or create those ingredients in a lab, all the component parts that go into creating one ingredient, purifying it, extracting it, putting it all together in one bottle, like 20 to 50 ingredients, like that is a huge impact for what becomes like a one ounce bottle of serum in a plastic bottle with a plastic cap and a little plastic, you know, dropper. And none of that is like recyclable, really. That's the other thing about beauty products is, you know, we're taught that plastic is recyclable. Really 91% of plastic is not recycled. And the plastic that is recycled can only be recycled two to three times before it becomes unusable. And then it just becomes, you know, pollution breaking down and never going away literally forever. Like every piece of plastic produced still exists in the planet in some form. Um, the other thing about beauty products is that they're usually so small that they cannot be recycled. Like there are size requirements for a lot of recycling facilities. 
etc 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 then you factor in the packaging the cardboard boxes the inserts the papers the sheets of plastic that sandwich your sheet mask the fuel emissions from shipping all of these products from factory to distributor to store to consumer like it's a lot there is a huge environmental um, component to our beauty behaviors that scares me. <laughs> I think it should scare anybody because we are in the middle of an environmental crisis. Um, that being said, it offers such a beautiful opportunity to divest from some of these products and connect with your own body and connect with the land around you and connect with your mind and start thinking of beauty products in terms of things that aren't necessarily material things you need to buy. So I would say the first step to sustainability in beauty is getting to know your skin. I have a lot of articles on like how to do this, but basically like now I've let my skin re-regulate. It does the hard work for me. I need maybe two products every once in a while an SPF to keep my skin going. I don't need to buy the insane amount of products I was buying before and my skin looks um, pretty great. <laughs> so like that has been a beautiful part of it for me. I think that should be the starting point for anyone who's concerned about the environmental impact of their beauty routine is just let your skin do what it need, knows how to do. Um, and then I, I practice what I call non-skincare skincare. So that's things like making sure I'm getting a lot of omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids in my diet through salmon, through nuts, through seeds, those go straight to the skin barrier, baby. Like that's instant glow. Um, things like bone broth. Bone broth has been really helpful for my skin and my gut. Um, just eating your antioxidants. You don't need an antioxidant serum all the time. You can just eat them from fruits and vegetables. Um, things like meditation. Medita meditation is scientifically proven to strengthen the skin barrier and lock in moisture. So when people are talking about like that inner glow, it's not necessarily just an inner glow. Like your skin is literally holding on to more moisture and reflecting light. Um, That's things so like, interesting. Yeah, gratitude practice, affirmations, all of these help with your body's stress response, reduce inflammation, reduce cortisol, and that all translates to your skin. So I just, there's so many things. I get like worked up talking about it. There's so many things that you can do to contribute to the health of your skin that don't involve a product. I'm curious that uh, meditation study, do you know how often they were meditating each day and how long they were meditating before they actually saw this benefit? Yeah. I mean, the studies are sort of like a bunch of different ones that look at meditation, that look at just breathing, um, how that impacts the stress response, and then extrapolating for how the stress response um, affects the skin and sort of merging all of these different studies together. Um, I've reported on it a couple of times and my the dermatologist that I talk to about it usually recommend five minutes to 30 minutes of meditation or breathing a day. Um, one dermatologist I talked to about it, her name is Dr. Whitney Bowe. She talks a lot about the gut brain skin connection. Um, she recommends taking a five minute breathing break every day. Um, and even that is enough to sort of help your skin barrier repair and re-regulate and, and lock in that moisture. And that's amazing because you might think you have to spend the whole day meditating, but you don't just oh, even five no. minutes can make an impact. Yeah, no, it can be so, so easy. I'm curious for you personally, in terms of meditation, have you found any modalities that you like? Do you do guided meditations? Do you do it yourself? Like I find that meditation you know, it's easier for people to get into the food stuff, but the meditation, there's a bit of resistance and a block. So I'm always curious yeah. how individuals actually get into meditation or have any tips. Yeah, I have gone through like a lot of different phases. I think when I started meditating, I would just um, YouTube like three minute meditation music, five minute meditation music. And I'd put on like a musical track and just sit there for five minutes. Um, and that was a really great intro for me because sometimes the guided meditations made me feel like a little like I don't know I would roll my eyes at them I would feel weird doing them I'd be like this is strange and it doesn't like resonate with me and I feel weird so music was helpful 
Um, affirmations and like mantras are really helpful for me too. So I will settle on a mantra or an affirmation, um, either, you know, sometimes centered around my skin, sometimes centered around my life and incorporate that. Um, when I was trying to heal my skin for the first time through meditation, when I was dealing with really bad um, dermatitis and topical steroid withdrawal, I started meditating one day and this mantra popped into my head and it was, I, I am beautiful on the inside and it shines through the outside. And I did a visualization. So I would breathe in and I would say, I'm beautiful on the inside. And I would imagine my body being filled with a golden light. And then I would breathe out and say, and it shines to the outside. And I would imagine that light just pouring through my pores. So I think that that combination of, of breath, mantra and visualization like really helped me get into it. And you're definitely glowing. I can see it radiating from your pores. <laughs> so what else are you thinking about in terms of the beauty industry? You're always, every time I get the newsletter, there's some interesting nugget, something I didn't think of before. So what, what's on your horizon right now? What are the things that you're thinking about? Oh man, there's so much. Um, I really want to write more about how the industry is reliant on fossil fuels and, and talk about how that affects the environment, how that affects our skin and what, like what material benefits we would really see as an industry and as individuals from divesting from fossil fuels. Um, so that, that's something that's super interesting to me. Uh, I'm also working on a piece right now that's sort of breaking down the beauty rule of not touching your face and like asking whether like is is touch that bad and honestly like it's really not touch is how we spread microbes and that's how our skin microbiome becomes strong and resilient and like touches touches like a life-saving measure sometimes so that research has been really interesting um there's there's so many things i'm working on something right now about the fda the food and drug administration and their regulation of cosmetic chemicals it's fascinating because you look at beauty and you think like, oh, it's beauty, but there are so many ways that it can like spread out in so many different sectors to cover from like the spiritual aspect to the mental health aspect to industry regulation and the environment. And I, I want to cover it all. Sometimes I feel a little, you know, all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, there's so many things. You're just like, oh my God, there's so many things oh, to think my. about. There's so many yeah. things to worry about. I'm curious um, about hyperpigmentation because I feel that's an issue. You know, a lot of people listening to the podcast maybe had acne or other skin conditions. Uh, what have you found to be really beneficial for hyperpigmentation? Sure. So the first thing that I like to say about hyperpigmentation is that um, hyperpigmentation is healing. The reason that it's so hard to treat is because it's not a problem. The reason it's so hard to treat hyperpigmentation is because hyperpigmentation is the healing. That is part of your skin's natural healing process. Um, so the, the best thing to do for hyperpigmentation is to support the health of your skin cells overall so that they can better perform these processes and work through that hyperpigmentation at um, a not delayed pace. Um, and I, I've written a ton about that before. It, it relies a lot on skin barrier health. So you can like Google my name and, and skin barrier and a bunch will come up about that. Um, for hyperpigmentation, topically, I love rosehip oil. Rosehip is a big one for me, rosehip and jojoba. I often will mix the two. Um, and over time, I do think that helps lighten scars and just sort of speed up that process of cellular turnover in a really gentle way. Um, vitamin C is great. And the, the other great thing about vitamin C is that you don't have to put it directly on your face. Um, there are no studies that show that topical vitamin C is any more effective than internal vitamin C. Um, so yeah, like eat your oranges, eat your vegetables, like get a ton of C and that really does help, um, you know, speed up those internal processes that, that eventually show up on the surface of your skin. Yeah, I think it, the important part is also eat your antioxidants. Mm -hmm. uh, because again, we're so used to like putting them on the outside and people don't realize it's the inside where you're actually going to get um, the biggest impact because you're really going to let your skin heal from within. Yeah, and the other the other thing about hyperpigmentation mm -hmm. is protection, um, which you'll, you know, you'll read in a ton of skincare articles. So 
course, SPF is great for protection, um, but the, the biggest protection that you have is your skin barrier. So just trying to disrupt it as little as possible um, and really just, you know, foster that inherent layer of protection that your skin already has. And that, that will help with hyperpigmentation over time. So you mentioned the gut brain skin axis earlier. Um, so are there any, th like any things in particular that you do to nourish that? Like you mentioned that you have bone broth, um, you know, mm. probiotics, uh, maybe, uh, can you talk a little bit about the gut health aspect of things? Sure. Yeah. I mean, bone broth and probiotics are, are two great ones. I try not to get super into the probiotic because again, that can sort of create this monoculture in the gut where there's too much of one certain bacteria and that's where problems can arise. Um, so I'm very big on prebiotics, a lot of fiber, a lot of veggies to give the organisms that already live within my gut, the food that they're craving. And that will help balance it out naturally because it'll, it'll feed the good ones that, that we want to thrive. Um, let me see. I'm trying to think. I mean, obviously, as you know, like things like meditation and stress relieving exercises and massage and all of that, like contributes to gut health as well. Like it, it really is all interconnected. So anything that sort of reduces inflammation uh, helps in that way. And the, the one thing that I found really interesting about healing my own gut was that initially when I was experiencing skin issues and I could trace them back to my gut, I thought I would have to restrict forever. I thought I would have to cut these things out of my diet forever because they were clearly irritating me. Once I focused on healing my gut with prebiotics, some probiotics, and just lots of like fresh vegetables and fruits and cooked foods. Cooked foods were a big one for me because my body was not digesting like raw foods and salads properly. Um, I found that I could incorporate things that I thought would be triggers back into my diet and they weren't triggering me anymore. Like, so for instance, I can eat cheese all I want now and it doesn't cause problems. Whereas four years ago when my gut was in a state of disrepair, it caused a lot of problems. So I always just like to say that it's, it's not so much about restriction. It's just about healing and then, and then you're good to go. Yeah, that's a really important point because sometimes what you have to do initially to heal is not what you'll have to do forever. And uh, with a lot of these food sensitivities, uh, once the gut is healed, you'll find that you can, can eat these foods again. Yeah. So is there anything else you want our listeners to know about skin and beauty and culture? Is there like any message you want to share or you think people should know? Oh, gosh. Um, I just, I just want to help people realize that the power within them is so much greater than the power of any pre-bottled product. I think that's kind of like my overall mission in a nutshell. And if I can, if I can get that message out to people, I'm happy. I love that. Really well said. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Jessica. And if you want more from Jessica, you can check out her website. It's jessica-defino.com and definitely get on her newsletter list, The Unpublishable. It is a, a goldmine of information. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. I loved it.